it's great to be with you today and wherever this time finds you across Victoria or other parts of Australia, across the globe, in North America, we have people listening in Europe, Asia, South America and Africa. And so to those listening on podcast or watching on YouTube, it's an honour to share with you today. Uh, today, we're continuing in the third of our brief series, looking at sharing your faith. If you missed the previous two messages, then I encourage you to take some time to have a watch of those or have a listen to those. Uh, to listen to the one about Rob Bell's NUMA DVD called Bullhorn and Samantha Barlow's message last week. Bullhorn gave us an uncomfortable reminder of some of the concerns that we have about shouting at people. While Rob used the imagery of a megaphone, the same could be said of gospel, some gospel tracks, uh, tweets or posts on social media. And once again, it's not to deny that some people do make life-changing decisions um, as a result of um, these things and become followers of Jesus. Others, unfortunately, block their ears. Last week, Sam shared with us about uh, the importance of three key ingredients when it comes to faith conversations and following the example of Jesus in hospitality and welcoming people, all sorts of people. Jesus' reputation that raises curiosity in the lives of others, then draws um, people to, that draws people to Jesus. And conversations where Jesus would enter into dialogue, a, a conversation with people. Jesus was passionate about disciple making. And as Sam shared last week, we see this passion for disciple making adopted by Jesus' closest friends who lived out that hospitality and welcome, developed a reputation that had others want to know more and enter into conversations with others about Jesus. The account that Anna just read just before was from Acts chapter 4 verses 1 to 12. And here we find two of Jesus' friends who the day before had healed a man who had been lame from birth. Peter and John start telling the crowd that gathered about the difference that Jesus makes in people's lives. And seeing the buzz of activity, the religious leaders and temple bouncers, the temple guard, are really disturbed by what Peter and John are saying and, and the crowd that they are attracting. So, they put an end to it by arresting Peter and John and possibly even the healed man. We're not quite sure until the following day. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever had to stand up in front of a group of people to give a presentation? It can be a bit nerve wracking. Even when you've practiced your presentation, you can have butterflies when you stand up in front of your class or your peers. The term is called glossophobia a fear of public speaking. If you've ever been to court where you've been called on to give evidence, then you can feel especially fearful, let alone if you are the person on trial having to represent yourself in court as a defendant. Now, it pays to remember that a few months earlier at night, beside the dancing light crackling sounds from a courtyard fire pit, Peter is questioned by two servant girls about his relationship with Jesus. And he denies knowing Jesus three times. Jump forward a few months, and here we have Peter and John on trial before the Jewish council, also called the Sanhedrin. Now, some of those in the Jewish council like to refer to the council meetings as the house of judgment, just to give you a bit of a glimpse of how they viewed that. That kind of gives you an idea of how the council leaders felt about those meetings at times. They would meet to pass judgment on legal matters, on religious matters, on political and social, that had political and social consequences as well. 
So here are Peter and John on trial and they would stand before the high priest. Now, outside the occupying Roman government, the high priest is the highest human authority in Jewish culture. And on either side of the high priest is 70 peak officials, religious lawyers, teachers, schools in every aspect of Jewish culture and religion. Dr. Luke, the writer of the letter we refer to as Acts, gives this account of the reaction the Jewish council had. And I want to take a few minutes to reflect on what clues this gives us today on having conversations with others about Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verses 13 to 14, it gives us this account. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognised them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there before them, among them, there was nothing that the council could say. Regardless of whether the healed man was in prison with Peter and John overnight or allowed to go home only to be brought back the following day for the trial, he is there in the room with Peter and John. The members of the council are used to debate and discussion with each other and, and their peers and seeing them as equal. They would not consider Peter and John as their peers. These are ordinary men, common men. They were not schooled or well-versed in religious law, nor rabbis, nor religious teachers. They weren't mentoring people. But the council were amazed by their boldness. Not to be misunderstood as arrogance or superiority. Instead, Peter and John display uncharacteristic confidence and courage. They are not ashamed and have freedom from fear. And as Sam said last week, the Holy Spirit is with them. Later, possibly even reflecting on this experience, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 16, in the first part of verse 16. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about the hope as a, your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way keeping your conscience clear. Peter treats the council with respect. Rulers and elders of our people, he refers to them as in Acts chapter four, verse eight. But he's courageous and confident, yes. But superior and arrogant, no. The council also knew that Peter and John were disciples of Jesus. They'd already established that, they already knew that. But here they recognise that, that their recognition of this comes to full knowledge and understanding that, that Peter and John have been with Jesus in a significant way. They're influenced by, they saw undeniable echoes of Jesus in these two men. So the council have two disciples in front of them and Peter and John are courageously speaking to the members of the council. Their language, their values, their behaviour, give the council a case of deja vu. It's like having a little bit of history repeating as the disciples speak. The council have flashbacks to Jesus standing before them. Peter and John give an account that Jesus has transformed the lame man's life. The problem for the council is that there before them, in their midst, 
is this one and the same man, once lame, now transformed and healed. The truth of a changed life is undeniable, no matter how much the council would like it to be otherwise. This makes their desire for suppression of the good news seemingly impossible. There was nothing that the council could say. For us today, as we reflect on this passage, I wonder what stands out for you and how this, might, this passage might influence your concern for others and your love for Jesus. For me, there's a couple of standout things that I want to take hold of and, uh, and help me to live out my relationship with Jesus well. Often people mistakenly think that you need to do some course before you can talk with others about Jesus. Oh, that's the pastor's job to do the work of discipleship, to have conversations with others about Jesus. I wouldn't know what to say, so instead I'll say nothing. But this account reminds me that you don't need special training to talk with others about your relationship with Jesus. Just like a mechanic, just like being a mechanic does not give you or make you have um, the ability to enjoy driving a car more, going to Bible college does not make you have a better relationship with Jesus. But you do need to have a relationship with Jesus in the first place to draw on. When Mary and I first got married, we lived in Beewar on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Our home was out of town. It was down a five kilometre dirt road and our water supply was from a well. Yep, think a traditional wishing well, only this time with an electric pump. Here's a couple of photos of the well being dug deeper with a drilling rig that was brought on site. While living there, I discovered the undeniable truth. What is in the well comes up in the bucket, including the tangy flavor of decomposing cane toads that occasionally got trapped in the well. You can't expect to have quality water come up in the bucket when you need it if you don't have quality water in the well. And it's the same when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. What is the quality of relationship that you draw on? You can't expect Jesus to influence you and use you if you don't draw from a rich relationship with Jesus that you invest time and energy in. Peter and John had a relationship with Jesus from which they could draw from. But they also continued to invest in it. Like a marinade that when it makes contact with the food, the food takes on the flavor, the more time and contact, the greater the flavor. Peter and John were in full, were full of the Jesus flavor in their life. So much so that their reputation with others revealed Jesus' influence not just in deed, but also in word. When you invest time in your relationship with Jesus and you allow it to marinate your life, the values of Jesus infuse into you and your decisions, your behaviour and actions, but also your words. Not to be bullhorn preachy, with an air of superiority and arrogantly pushing your views on others, but like Peter and John, to be create, uh, courageous when the opportunities present themselves. We need to be courageous and to be prepared to take opportunities when they present themselves. We need to pray for opportunities, pray to recognise the opportunities that come our way. If you spend time with Jesus, then Jesus will help you to recognise those opportunities. And when you do miss them, like me with the salsa dancer that I talked about last week in our Q&A time afterwards, 
And when you do see them, you can celebrate that. You don't have to do special training, but you do need to invest in a relationship with Jesus so that when you have opportunities, you can be courageous and draw on your relationship. In the Jewish world, things were fairly black and white. Absolute or universal truth was the norm. In the Roman world, as we discover with Pilate when he's interrogating Jesus, the truth was more relative. What is truth? The claim that all truth is relative is in itself a nonsense claim because the statement places itself as an absolute truth. All truth is relative, an absolute truth. Well, no, it can't be an absolute truth if you're saying all truth is relative. So it debunks absolute truth in and of itself. But the argument remains that Christians who take Jesus at his word believe in absolute truth, which we do. So there are those who want to refuse refuse absolute truth and want to reject the teaching of Jesus. But regardless of someone's view of truth, what cannot be easily denied is a changed life. When we live for ourselves, looking out for number one and for a good time, and then when we come in contact with Jesus and begin this process of transformation and start living life well, start living life with a value for others and our world, when we go through a transformation of work ethic, or stewardship of resources and and the way we see people around us and we see them differently. When we stuff up and when we get things wrong and we hurt others and we now take responsibility for our actions, when we seek forgiveness and try to make things right, when we are prepared to own our faith and valuing of Jesus publicly, then our story of the impact of Jesus on our life is much harder for others to deny. For the Jewish council, it's pretty hard to deny that a lame man's life has been changed when he's literally standing there in their midst. Once again, this is not about shoving it down someone's throat or Bible bashing someone by relentlessly quoting scripture at them. But this is about your reputation, as Sam said last week. Do they see Jesus making a difference to the way you live in what you do and say? I'm happy to chat some more with you about this or hear your experiences. But for now, how might we respond? Well, Let me ask you a couple of questions and then we'll have a few minutes where we can have some music played and you can uh, reflect on those uh, statements that are up on the screen. And then uh, if you want to, we can come back and have a little bit of Q&A if you wanted to ask some particular questions of me or of others as well in that. But how is my relationship with Jesus at the moment? And what am I doing to invest in it? Remember, what's in the well comes up in the bucket. Commit to pray for opportunities to enter into courageous conversations with others. Commit to pray for those opportunities, but also pray to recognise those opportunities as well. And if you miss them, don't beat yourself up over them, but pray for new opportunities to enter into courageous conversations. How is my life being changed for the better because of my relationship with Jesus? How am I appropriating? How am I allowing the marinade of the gospel and the good news of Jesus and the kingdom values to impact my life for the better? There's going to be some music played. And then uh, I invite you to respond to the things that God's saying to you today. God bless you.